Hello and good evening to everybody. My name is Usche Merck and I'm a project coordinator at Medico International. A very warm welcome to our third conference and panel discussion in the series of Rethinking Africa 2020. Focusing on a critical reflection of 60 years of independence. We are really happy that you joined the discussion. Unfortunately, our colleague Dr. Boniface Mabanza will not be able to accompany the meeting today with his brilliant way of facilitation because he's not feeling well. So I will take over and try not to replace him, but to guide you through our meeting. Whereas the first two discussions analyzed historical, political and economic perspectives, Today, we are focusing on the debate around the construction of the self-image and the image of others. Many voices from the continent are discussing the necessity of decolonizing the imagination from foreign colonial constructions and from the devaluation of African cultural and epistemic coordination systems, as Fermin Saar called it. We have two very interesting and inspiring speakers today who will try and give us some food for thought about these questions from different angles before we enter into a joint discussion. Our first speaker is Mrs. Kuketsu Moiti. She's a civic activist based in South Africa and the founder of Amandla Mobi, a cell phone based collective action tool with a community of over 600,000 people, mainly from low-income communities, black women most affected by injustice. Prior to this, Moiti worked and consulted for a wide range of national and international organizations. In 2019, she was announced as an Atlantic Fellow for Racial Equity, and she's also part of the inaugural class of Obama Foundation Fellows and an Aspen New Voices Senior Fellow. And Moiti is founding member of the African Digital Rights Network. I also want to introduce our second speaker, Professor Dr. Tsongola Talaya from the African and Global Studies at the University of North Carolina who is heading the Department of African, African-American and Diaspora Studies. He's connecting to us from Kinshasa, but there seems to be some technical problems, so we're still waiting for him and hope we will see him in a few minutes and I can give you some more background about him. Our first presentation from Kuketsu Moeti will center on decolonizing feminist thinking and the social justice sector. Kuketsu, the floor is yours. Thank you. I'm really honored to be joining you all this evening. So in South Africa, um, comprehensive sexuality education, a new curriculum around sex education was going to be introduced. In response to this, the African Democratic Party, which is a political party in the country, threatened to take the Department of Education to court. So they believe that parents should teach children about sex and not the state. So the SADP was not the only formation that was opposed to the bringing in of comprehensive sexuality education. The South African Teachers Union and other religious lobby groups also opposed it. The latter even turned to misinformation to register the opposition. The opposition is, of course, ill-advised because it deprives children of the opportunity to learn so they can make informed and safe choices about responsible, responsible sexual activity, something not all parents teach at home. But the opposition to comprehensive sexuality education, which teaches things like consent, bodily autonomy, sexual and reproductive health, as well as gender and sexual diversity, isn't only about this differing philosophy towards sex education. There was a much more sinister agenda to it. New research found that pro-family advocacy groups with ties to the U.S. evangelical Christian far-right were actually behind the opposition. 
It is part of the effort to expand the anti-women, anti-sexual reproductive rights, homophobic, transphobic ideology under the facade of protecting what they call the natural family. And South Africa was not the only target. Ghana too experienced severe pushback on its sexuality education proposals, as have Nigeria and Kenya. Indeed, across the world, ultra-conservative groups have been uniting to not only reject sexuality education and women's rights, but also to promote a bitterly hostile anti-LGBTIQ and anti-abortion dogma. And this is exactly what informed a lot of the opposition to comprehensive sexuality education. In Ghana, one of the fiercest opponents of sexuality education is what is called the National Coalition for Proper Human Rights and Family Values, who have described comprehensive sexuality education as an active strategy and satanic attempt to spread LGBTIQ acceptance on the continent. The coalition is a local partner um, behind a gathering that was hosted called the African Family and Sustainable Development, Strong Families, Strong Nation, which was described as a summit of hate, which was hosted in Accra. And there they again tore into comprehensive sexuality education. And again there, the influence of the U.S. evangelical Christian far right was evident. The gathering was organized by the World Congress of Families a U.S.-based organization with Russian links that has been identified as a hate group. Investigations have also shown that the World Congress of Families has numerous links to a variety of Islamophobic, white supremacist movements and have had a hand in influencing anti-LGBTIQ legislation across the world. So the U.S. evangelical Christian far right has a long legacy of exporting the most extreme aspects of the movement outside the U.S. So it's therefore dangerous to think about those driving the opposition to comprehensive sexuality education as, you know, people, though, and they prey on existing prejudice and nefarious means. But they're not a bunch of fools, right, um, whose opposition is not rooted in reality and evidence. They know exactly what they are doing and are part of a growing movement that has, I quote, crystallized the ideology under the banner of family, a descriptive and benign term that has turned into a primary frontier of social wars. The World Congress of Families has been identified as a prime example of today's anti-rights lobby by organizations such as the Association for women's rights and development, among many others. In 2017, a collaborative project coordinated by Arwood released a report that found that conservative and religious groups often fixate on gender and sexuality in their policy efforts. This includes, I quote, using the bodies of women, girls, and individuals with non-conforming gender identities or sexual orientations as a battlefield in these struggles to appropriate and maintain institutional and social power. The report goes on to note how the chipping away of institutions and protections manifests in the rights, in attacks to rights to bodily integrity, sexual orientation, gender identity, reproductive rights and health, including access to comprehensive sexuality education, contraception and safe abortion among so much more. Now, it's important to note, as noted by scholar Haley McEwan, who's a research coordinator at the University of Witwatersrand here in South Africa, decision makers need to recognize the geopolitical networks of power that support um, these agendas. Indeed, it is crucial for us to not only defend, but also expand movements and mechanisms of protection for all the demographics targeted by these evangelical groups. But it's also key that we deeply interrogate the legacies that make them possible. The World Congress of Families and others did not just happen. They are a direct consequence of legacies of power, domination, conflict, and struggle that can be traced back to European conquest 
colonization and imperious expansion of the past. To do this, we also cannot begin to do that hard work without interrogating the origins and ideological influences of the social justice sector, lest our analysis of these groups, you know, um, remain quite liberal, remain quite shallow, remain quite superficial. We have to question, how do we again and again find ourselves at a point with the language of social justice, the language of rights, the language, language that tries to masquerade as decolonial. Think about how these groups regularly invoke the language of this is an African to try and justify their positions. This was without a doubt another manifestation of the power, domination, conflict, and struggle, which I just referred to earlier. And this is because Africans, and indeed historically oppressed people everywhere, are often reduced to ontological foreigners, non-humans, who can be assaulted by multiple, mutually constitutive forms of violence in all our love dimensions, right? And this is at the heart of it. So in this instance, the example I gave earlier, Africans are being demanded to see themselves not from our own histories, not from our own knowledge, not from our own legacies, but really through a colonial imagination of who we are meant to be, right? This violence, this form of violence cannot be ignored by those of us who consider ourselves to be doing the work of social justice. Indeed, the social justice sector, as it is now called, has gone through many iterations, you know? There was a point it was development, there was a point almost throughout every era it has renamed themselves, but right now it's kind of the in thing to refer to the social justice sector. It is an institution that exists in this very real world, in this very real world of colonial legacies, of dominant powers, of different forces at play. So in other words, we have to get to the bottom of what does social justice mean when we refer to ourselves as social justice agents? What are we actually talking about? Words and their meanings are not neutral. Are we reinforcing the capitalist colonialist logics that exist? Or are we imagining a world, you know, a world outside of that? And this will require us to ask ourselves some fundamental questions, right? When we speak of the social justice sector, too often it is assumed to be inherently good just because of those words that many people cannot even define. There's a couple of key set of questions that I think we would be forced to interrogate if we want to get to the bottom of this. What are the ideologies that underlie and underpin the idea of social justice? At whose expense do these ideologies, ideologies exist? Most importantly, who benefits from these ideologies? And if our answer to that question is not that the social justice sector is completely tied to a politics, to a struggle for politics and a practice of anti-capitalist decolonization, we will find that indeed the social justice sector is falling short. Now, I speak about the legacies that informed the rise of, or that brought us here with groups like the World Congress of Families and many others expanding on the continent, right? And taking over who we see ourselves to be. But this is not a new thing. Of course, what is happening today cannot be compared to what is happening in the past. But we can, without a doubt, not understand what is going on today without really, really revisiting the past and finding out what are the things that continuously lead us to this point where groups like this, groups that are deeply rooted in colonial imperialism,
can usurp the languages and strategies of those who call themselves so-called social justice actors. In our recent past, when we think about social subjects, social relations, and forms of social organizations, they are so fundamentally marked by colonialism and capitalism that it would be a mistake. It would be a grave mistake to contemplate ourselves and our role in this sector without deeply interrogating and dismantling what informs that within the sector. So it's clear, um, as, I, as the example I've made mentioned above, that many of the processes and practices that are a direct result of capitalist and colonialist expansion and conquer have evolved. They have evolved to a point where all institutions are being taken in by them. What makes anybody else think that the social justice sector is any different from any institution that exists in our society? So we must insist, and indeed we have the obligation, if we really want to make change in the world and really alter social relations at a very fundamental level, disrupt power as it's currently constituted and reorganize our societies in which people can imagine and be fully human and not merely ontological foreigners in their day-to-day -day lived relations, we will have to think about what is the practice we as an institution, we as the mechanics of the social justice sector will have to do about it. And this will require abolishing and divesting from a colonial capitalist logic which currently reinforces how we exist. So that is all I will leave you with for now. Thank you. I am hoping that has spurred some thought and I would love to hear more so that we can have a discussion about this. Thank you very much, Koketso. That was quite a dense input. And um, um, I still, I'm still busy digesting. Uh, to understand what you have said and may I just try maybe just come in with one question if you could maybe give us another example what you think what are the struggles what are the challenges in the social justice sector you think we should take up now maybe give us one example um, so that we can understand a bit deeper uh, what, what the, the, the quite uh, challenging thesis you have presented. Thank you. So I think when we don't dig as deep and deeply interrogate to the things um, that I have mentioned, one of the challenges where we find ourselves, like in South Africa, the concept is called transformation, right? Where you have a system or an institution and we think that suddenly what was once a colonial system all you need to do is add a black person and stir and everything will be okay. That is not how it works, right? That does not mean the institution will fundamentally reorganize and reshape and weigh the work that it does. Indeed, we see this on most of the continent, right? Where people took over what was essentially a colonial state and what it has resulted in is in the same ways police were deployed against certain people, it remains the same today. You think about Nigeria and why they were protesting against the NSARS protests. Um, you think about in Kenya, the violence that we have seen in poor low-income neighborhoods, police violence against people who live in those. Indeed, we can think about South Africa where regularly, you know, police violence is meted out on certain kinds of people. So I think it, the challenge there is, the challenge being put is this idea of superficial transformation, right? Merely doing things like in the development sector that has traditionally been right by, run by ideologies, certain ideologies and certain people, merely changing those faces 
will upend the institution. It, in fact, it will not. So when we think about how we want to make the changes both internally, because this is the thing, the tough thing about social justice, right? Social justice doesn't only exist there. Indeed, social justice out there in the world can only be built when we in our own institutions are not reinforcing very old colonial capitalist systems and ways of being, you know? So I think the challenge for us is how do we reimagine and reimagine not just thinking that we are coming up with new solutions, but actually tapping into legacies of thinking and ways of being that existed in the past that we can then use to build forward. I know that was a very long answer, but I hope it is the beginning of a conversation. No, that's fine. Um, thank you very much. I think I have a lot of ideas in my mind, but I will want to just give the floor to if there's any kind of question from the chat or anyone in from if maybe uh, who is in the in the panel who wants to add. I, I know that Boniface is listening to us, but I'm not sure if he's well enough to add a question. Yule, you are looking at yeah, the just a message from the chat. Yeah. So, um, yeah, many people are sending greetings. And there is a question by Dominic Ritter who asks, but how to interrupt power structures? So I guess he's referring to, yeah, for sure, post-colonial continuities what would be your proposal to interrupt them? Pretty so huge what, question. Yeah, yeah. It's a very big question, right? And there is no ways that I can completely sum it up in its entire, entirety, right? Um, the first thing that it needs, I would argue, is that it needs a bit of humility. There is no single organization or single individual who is going to be able to do it all, right? And in fact, very often we think of ourselves and our organizations and our movements as being at the center of the world. We are challenging power structures and governments that have so much more capacity and resources that in many ways we are on the periphery. What brings us closer to the center is working together, right? Disrupting in various ways. One good example of this that recently happened, there's a good article I'll share a link later is what is going on with um, one of the biggest um, providers of sexual reproductive health services in the US, um, Planned Parenthood. So Planned Parenthood, of course, has a legacy that it was, it was created, it was part of the eugenics movement, right? Where it was trying to build a superior race. But it is quite important, right now we've seen them cut um, ties to you know, their founder and so on. And one article, um, I just cannot remember the author, does the important work of noting that it's not only, you know, outside in the world, there's been so much talk of reproductive sexual health and all of that, and many battles in courts and so on. But what really pushed it was the women who were doing the work internally, right? But the women doing the work internally wouldn't have succeeded on their own without this big work that was happening externally, you know? So I think that's part of the challenge, thinking about how do we, people outside certain institutions, how do we support the changes that are being made there? And actually, if an institution does not um, fulfill this promise of a new, you know, of a new world, why don't we just divest from it completely, right? So it requires both that internal, external work. It requires us doing very, very different things. I remember in South Africa during the Fees Must Fall movement, which some people may have read about, um, when there was a call for the free decolonized higher education, you know, some of the critiques that came forward um, against the student movement was that if you are not organizing to get basic education, which is like our primary education solved, people will just not reach higher education. Your focus area is wrong. Instead of finding ways to build connections with the movement, right, and external people doing the work, recognizing that the students were being brutalized by police and so many other things were happening and could not do it all. There was this pinned expectation that this movement would challenge and change everything. 
So I think this is a long-winded way of describing that challenging the power structures really requires that we don't see the work as something that only happens out there. We actually all have to move outside of our comfort zones and challenge power wherever we see it, right? And this is this is the kind of like dirty work. There's this um, concept of not in my backyard. One of the things I've always made a reference to is that there are many people in South Africa, as one example, who would call themselves anti-capitalist. But when you look at some of the anti, so-called anti-capitalist critique, they are opposed to black accumulation. They are not opposed to capital in and of itself, right? And that is the hard work that you need to do, divesting from the whole, not in my backyard, you know? If you say you support the struggle for land and so on, we often, there's a term that's called land invasion in South Africa. It's often used only to describe poor people who are erecting shacks. But what we see is that homeowners are increasingly taking up public space, whether by erecting boom gates in their communities, whether by, you know, encroaching with um, surveillance technologies and so on. But we don't call that a land invasion. We have to ask ourselves, why is it that that happens, right? And challenge it, you know, in our neighborhoods, in our organizations, yeah. Thank you. Yule, is there anything else in from the chat? Some more questions? Mm -hmm. um, there was a question um, if there are more concrete ideas how to change the system. But I guess, Koketsu, you already gave us plenty of them. So I hope that this, this question already got an answer. If there is more um, yeah, detailed stories, context occurring to you, um, you might maybe uh, put another note on that. Um, I personally would like, I mean, considering myself uh, being a feminist and you thought, um, what can we do against it? We as an institution, uh, I was wondering, what would you tell uh, potato feminists from, from here living in Germany? Is there any, any possibility to form a common political subject and, I mean, support um, struggles or which what would you tell feminists from here in order to be part of decolonial feminist struggles or support them or whatever? And there is another question. Uh, may I ask it now? Also? Okay. Okay. So um, a question was what you think about the concept of the African Renaissance um, by Tabu Mbeki and the African Union? <laughs> so three question at, at once <laughs> thanks okay i think as feminists you know uh, when i think about the legacies of feminists and feminism um there was a deep recognition that transnational solidarity is essential right when we talk about um colonial imperialism um and what europe did to like different parts of the world It can't be fixed by people out there, right? It has to be fixed at home. So I do think that, yeah, there are very, very concrete examples that one, one can draw on in that sense, and it is indeed essential. And even if we think about the world right now, you know, you, you can talk about issues such as tax justice, you know, just name it. We would have a subsidiary here in Africa, or there's a subsidiary elsewhere on the continent. Um, the main company is based elsewhere and they are shuffling money out, essentially out of those countries. You're not going to win that battle by working within narrow national borders, right? Um, we are seeing right now, whether we talk about the conflict in Ethiopia and different things that are going on in different parts of the world, we can see that people are moving, you know, migration is as old as humanity and that is not going to stop, you know? And this means that we can't limit our thinking only within the constructs of narrow national borders, which are themselves a very colonial project, you know? Yeah, so I do think that there is definitely an obligation to be thinking about ways in which this transnational solidarity, transnational movement, and when I talk about solidarity, love, and some of these concepts that we, we refer to in this space, 
not talking about them as a passive feeling for each other, right? As passive shows. It is about that constant work of thinking in this place of influence I have. What are the concrete actions I can take as an individual, as an individual who's part of an institution, as an individual who exists in a particular society that will work in the benefit of others, right? Recognizing that in that way we benefit ourselves as well, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, I don't want these things to be taken as, you know, it's a very passive like feeling. Oh, the people are struggling there with this and whatever. Oh, I am so, I feel a particular way about it. It definitely is going to require so much more than that. So on the issue of the African Renaissance, you know, um, I struggle a lot with it. And what does that mean? A Renaissance for whom, driven by whom, right? When I think of some of these concepts, most of the, the questions I ask myself, for whose benefit at whose expense, you know? And very often when people use concepts like that, but are unable to describe how it benefits us all or how it reconfigures power, I become very wary. I remember there was a time when, and we've been through this a lot, right, where all of these false binaries are being drawn. One of the things I quite clearly remember was um, when there was this whole disrupting the narrative around the continent, around Africa, you know, Suddenly, you know, all people see is war, one-dimensional human beings who just are not full humans, who should and can be exercising agency and live fully dignified lives and actually have long legacies of histories amongst them. And what was painted was this picture of, um, what do you call it? Of like, yeah, Africa is okay. Everything is hunky-dory, right? As if we don't have these legacies of, power and colonialism and imperialism that exists, you know? And so I do think that part of solving this is what um, author and organizer Charlene Carruthers describes as telling more complete stories about ourselves, where it's not only an issue of, you know, a renaissance that's necessary um, in relation to others, right? A renaissance that sees itself in relation to others. Or it's not only these false binaries of, Africa is either only good or only bad, you know? What are the more complete stories um, about ourselves, about us as people, about us as human beings that should be told, that take us out of the space of, um, yeah, yeah, this kind of like viewing only in relation to. So there's a book, um, a textbook, Strategies for Building Organizations with the Soul, written by Professors Ho Chikudu and Rudo Chikudu, which warn against um, certain, one of the things they refer to is woundology, right? Where they talk about how, you know, you've been wounded, you're a person of trauma, and you can so easily only listen to the sound of your wounds that you don't really hear the other sounds of life that are going on around you, right? And this doesn't only happen to a people, it's also imposed on a people. So when we talk about all these legacies of intergenerational trauma, when we talk about trauma and so on, how do we also tap into the legacies of deep intergenerational wisdom that exists within our people, that exists within us every day? So again, I go back to the African Renaissance until I'm quite clear who it benefits at whose expense, until I am clear that it's not a renaissance because we want Africa to be seen in relation to, I actually have no feelings or interested interest in it, to be honest. Mm. Thank you very much. Maybe I want to also have one other question, which I would like to add. In the beginning, you said you were talking about this right-wing movement mobilizing against uh, feminism, against uh, sexual reproductive rights, etc. And it's also been done under the topic, under the argument of being un-African, yeah? yeah? And maybe even using the decolonizing language in order to justify this kind of 
uh, right wing movement. And and I wonder how how do you see that, and what makes it? I mean, why is it approaching uh, to different African uh, government structures, power struggles? To support that, because we can see it in in many countries that there are movements, uh, um, kind of anti-feminist feminist movements in that sense, who are justifying it with being that it's un-African. I don't know how you see that, and why. What is the background? What? How do you see that with regard to the 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 uh, colonial legacy and the 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 imaginary space which it creates mm. so i think um yeah it's definitely it's definitely arising but it's also not new right we saw this this existed in the 70s um and other phases as well it's almost like um it evolves and comes back a little bit stronger right where where you've moved as a society it catches up with the terminology that's in at that time usurps it and uses it for its own purpose. What was fascinating for me about this battle against um, comprehensive sexuality education, which is such a, you know, people think that it's a small topic, it's a non-issue. This is just about teaching kids about sex, right? But it's actually linked to so much more. This is an issue of reproductive justice and so on. What's fascinating for me is the invocation of the words of rights, right? I have a right for my child to not be taught this at school. This infringes on my right, you know, if my child is taught this at school and how other people, the way people are living and so on, just, yeah, it invokes this whole rights conversation. I think part of it is also just, um, it tells us a lot about um, some of the progress that has been made, right? Because this is a direct backlash. If you look at every generation where this right-wing movement has evolved and kind of like regathered its bearings and became a new monster, you will always see that there have been some massive big wins by the feminist movement at that time, right? And so it's also part of this like backlash that we see. Um, we can talk about backlash in the economic rights space. We can talk about backlash in so many different spheres, but this is directly on the progress that's being made on that end. This idea of it is an African, this is also the thing about, um, I mean, I was laughing, this is a white supremacist, right, during this conference of hate, who is talking about even the imagination of who an African is, you know, is so colonial there is no sense that, you know, Africans are, can and have been much more than that, you know? And so one of the things he was talking about was how, yeah, um, all these fights um, for LGBTIQ rights to be recognized on the continent, people to um, be recognized and live with dignity and so on, you know? It is, um, it is part of a white supremacist movement that's trying to, you know, take over the world. A whole white supremacist, like invoking the idea of a white supremacist movement, you know, to justify his own actions. I mean, it was, it was quite disturbed. It was chilling. It was funny, but it was quite chilling to observe. And even just the passion and the belief with which it was said, you know. And I think this is also what happens when we have such incomplete stories about ourselves and who we are. We forget that some of the things we are told are un African, are indeed not. But also the idea of what is an African, right? Did we become African only by looking at ourselves in relation to, you know, the imperial conquerors of the past? You know what I mean? These are also some of the things that should be deeply interrogated. Um, yeah, yeah. It doesn't answer your question completely, but I hope it is helpful. Yeah. Thank you very much. Maybe I pose the question to the public and, and I go to Yuli to see for uh, what is in the chat. Are there more questions, comments from the public to this discussion? Um, yes, there are. So there is a comment from the novella from Kenya. Uh, he says the capitalist 
monolithic and colonial power structure manifests in African, African elections, in instances where the voice of the people have spoken in a democratic space, the incumbent rig election and external West structures endorsed the junta way of conforming government, uh, governments, regardless of number of people who have al already lost their lives. So maybe that is also a comment on that you could link with um, supremacist influences within elections from Western either ideologies and or concrete personal influences. And then he says that is also a reason why it is being so easy to tap into resources in Africa for uh, European and uh, Western stakeholders. If you would like to comment on that. Um, and another footnote is that Professor Nwangola um, is trying to connect. So. He's there, he probably will be able to join us afterwards. Awesome. Yeah, so I think the geopolitical space, right, and the influences of, um, yeah, we can't take for granted just the influences caused by all of these legacies and much more contemporary forms of um, imperial conquest, right? It shouldn't be forgotten. Even the idea of, it's very fascinating for me, even the idea of what is democratic and who defines what democracy is, right, comes into question there. We often, um, we have, you know, countries that are considered to be some of the most democratic in the world. We have seen that their oppressed people do not experience those countries as being democratic. And in many ways, think of, of a country like the US, right? We, I mean, us watching the elections, there is nothing democratic about that process, right? But here is a country that is willing to drop bombs to democratize others, right? This is a country that is willing to, you know, send others to observe because they can do democracy better. So yeah, the geopolitical aspects of all of this and this whole thing about resources, right? Again, goes back to the question, who benefits when people are not living well, are not living dignified, full lives in which they are agents, right? Who benefits is always such an important question because in that you'll find answers that point you to these geopolitical links, to these imperial links, you know, um, to new forms of power concentrating within, right? Because we often talk about colonialism as well as if it is... Um, yeah, as if it's something that only happens by external forces. But we do see that internally within countries, right, there is a neocolonial forces that do exist amongst us that do the work of the colonial state for them, actually. Thank you. Yule, is... Um... Is yes. there any, is uh, Dr. Tsongola already in? No. Um, not um, yet. In the background, people are working hard for him to okay. join. <laughs> um, uh, and we hope that he will get into the conversation really mm -hmm. soon. Um, Marita Sanson left a comment. She says, uh, feminism challenges male, white and black power and sexism helps them to gain their power and to gain, maintain the privilege and therefore they fear women power. Um, can you, I mean, just the context, um, as you said, white supremacy is also not only a male supremacy, but is also bound uh, with fear of, might be legitimate or not, but with the fear of losing privileges. So, yeah, what would you answer or comment on on that? Fearing so, women power. <laughs> yeah, I do worry about um, phrases like that, right? Sometimes. So phrases like woman power, phrases like, you know, girl boss and all of that. So one of the things I mentioned earlier is that you can you can't like People often think of transformation as add a black and stir and things will be okay, add a woman and stir and things will be okay. A patriarchal institution 
does not necessarily, will not necessarily be upended by a woman, you know, running the place, right? And also the whole woman power thing suggests also that people, women themselves, are not invested in the project of white supremacy, which we know is very, very false. So I always say, I always think that we should dig a little bit deeper. When we talk about the things people stand to lose, we're not talking about small privileges here. We're talking about power. We're talking about control. We're talking about domination, right? Which many people are very, very willing to go to, you know, a long end for. So I think these are the deeper questions that we should ask ourselves. We're um, going beyond the liberal analysis, going beyond the the capitalist analysis, you know, going into an actual anti-colonial, anti-capitalist framework will require that we interrogate some of this a little bit more. Um, is it a win? If we're talking about, if we think about some of the imperial forces, we were just talking about, you know, the U.S. military and the bombs being dropped. Is it a win if a woman now runs the U.S. military? Um, a woman dropping bombs on kids, you know, black and brown kids in other parts of the world. It's not. Do you know what I mean? We're talking about something a little bit much more substantial than that. But yeah, I do think that we should be, I'm very cautious about um, those kind of phrases because they assume that there is a joint ideological standing um, between women everywhere. And we know both historically and today that is just not true. Apart from the racial line, we can talk about the class lines that exist between us, you know, the we are seeing like the rise of xenophobia everywhere across the world. Right. Um, and so on. Right. Um, there are people who are considered to not be women enough to not even be human, much less a woman, you know. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for um, explaining and reframing. Um, I'm sorry, I'm afraid my microphone is making, is noisy. Hmm? Um, another question um, comes from Dobrota Pucherova. I hope I pronounced your name well. Um, are human rights universal? Some African critiques argue that, uh, that it's, or they are a Western concept that has been imposed so I think, you know, there's been a lot of critique about the concept of human rights, right? Um, and part of it is really um, a lot of places that suddenly came up with the um, idea of human rights. It was at a time where there were a lot of people who were not considered human. So you had human rights that were uniquely for those who are considered human. You know, we're talking about times when black people were not considered to be human. And in some parts, that still is so. And, you know, so on. So I think that's where a lot of the critique around human rights exists, that will they ever be considered universal in a world in which not everybody is, every human being is considered to be human, where humanity is tied to these, you know, existing superstructures, right? That these power structures that exist all around us, right? Um, yeah, yeah. So I think some of the critiques are fair. Um, I do not want to go into deep, deep detail on that because I just feel like I do not know enough. But on the other hand, I do think it is fair to question um, whether it is possible to make human rights universal in a world where today, both historically and today, not every human being is considered to be a human. Some are so more human than others, right? Thank you. I, I would like to just add another question, if I may. Yeah, we, we, we're having this um, series of um, discussions around 60 years of independence. Within, I mean, a number of countries uh, in Africa gained independence 60 years ago, not, not all, and of course differently, and reflecting about that. And you were mentioning the social justice sector. And of course, uh, if you... Um, for in an organization like Medico International is already 50 years old. And I think it's an organization who has been, been um, fueled by 
let's put it two different kind of historical traditions. The one is this whole social justice and development sector has been a continuation of what previously missionaries did, what the colonial project of social work was, and which continued in what was, was called then development work and social justice work, which was a, a quite a paternalistic approach of, of some redistribution, but also some kind of ideological um, propaganda instrument. And of course, it changed in the last uh, decades, but it, it, it's still part of that legacy. And of course, there's another legacy, which is uh, solidarity struggles, uh, political struggles between different social struggles and so in solidarity internationally, which have another anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist outlook, etc. And I think just as an example for an organization like Medico, who cannot uh, completely escape uh, both, uh, I mean, also the colonial tradition, yeah? What yeah. kind of um, perspectives, what kind of visions would you have uh, for, for the, so in collaboration between um, an organization like Medico and uh, different African, activists and organizations who are struggling for change. What what kind of uh, collaboration can you envision or see? And what would mm. be de de decolonization? What would that mean in, in terms of that relationship? So, you know, I think there is, yeah, that is quite a big question and I probably will not answer it like completely, right? But I do think that, um, there's a way in which practices can shift, you know, practices of domination and so on. So when we think about the colonial state, for an example, right, one of the things um, that it does value is this idea of um, obedience. You know, a colonial state expects obedience. It does not see itself under an obligation to get consent from the people that it governs, you know? And so that's also part of how this power often plays out. Um, one of the ways in which we can't escape the fact in an unequal world, in a world as unequal as ours, that all money, all wealth is bad money, right? And it should be, the challenge should be, how do we redistribute that money in ways that fundamentally shift that power line, you know? And this comes from the little stuff around the interactions, right? Where interactions begin from a space of trust um, and thinking about one of the things that has made the right, the ultra conservative right wing base so powerful, right? Is that actually they have unrestricted funding. They can be very responsive, you know? They are allowed to get on with things and don't pause. Whereas progressive movements are all too often subjected to all of this, you know, you have to work hard, prove this, prove that, you know, it's restricted. It can only be used that way. It's not responsive to the needs of the people that you are serving, right? And also looking at the flows of money, how the money flows in itself is another reinforcement of power structures, right? Where do most of the funds go? Do they actually go to organizations that make the change, that are doing the work, or do they solely go to organizations that have the ability to complete like log frames and all of these other mechanisms, right? That in itself reinforces certain power lines, right? And again, this should not be confused. To say that money should be unrestricted and to talk about log frames is not to talk about, is not to say that we shouldn't be accountable, right? But I am just saying that these are the ways in which power is reinforced. A couple of years ago in South Africa, of course, it happened with other big organizations such as Oxfam and so on. But in South Africa, what we had was um, the revelation that in certain organizations, they had been, you know, there was a culture of um, sexual misconduct that was going on. And this was exposed in the newspapers and so on. And one of the things that was most heartbreaking was when people speak about how we could not, the big man syndrome, we could not say anything about him 
because we were scared we would lose the funds. The organization, which does this crucial work, would lose the funds if we lose this one guy. And that in itself tells you a lot about how those money power lines are working, right? Where they are not being done in ways that prop up the work, the values and the mission, they are instead about propping up individuals. And I say this very interestingly, as somebody who's become a bit visible, right? Through fellowships and so on. What is the obligation an organization like Amandla has, you know, with its partners to like also support the crucial work that's being done there? Um, and also just how visibility also changes certain things, right? Where suddenly even the work that you are doing, um, somebody will want to come fund you because you're visible right now, right? The association is very good, but how do you reject it? And the ability to actually reject it and say, this is not values aligned. This is not what Amanda does. You can't impose. These are also some of the things that we should be doing, you know, quite frequently. And I do also think that having that space to do so is, is quite, quite crucial, you know? So I think that's how the partnerships work. I think about some of the funding relationships that we have had, that we have, you know? And of course, Amandla has had to reject money in the past because it was definitely not values aligned. It came in with ties that were not mission driven and so on. But also the idea of white tutelage. I'll never forget when I was asked um, if Amandla, if somebody like, oh, if Amandla wants funding, please put these people on your board, right? And the idea that this organization needed white tutelage to actually work, right? It was impossible, you know, being the way it was done. Our community, because they are predominantly Black people, low-income Black people, who we survey and find out what are the things we should focus on are incapable of thinking and acting, you know? And so, yeah, it, it's the choices that you have to make. And then you have partnerships that it's understood that you have to actually be responsive. And that's why we should shy away from those. Then we have partnerships. It's understood that actually we have to be responsive. And this is what is needed in this moment by the community. And we shall act that way. And we have so much leeway to act that way, you know? Um, yeah. So I think that's, that's the thinking. And this is inherently about, you know, moving what Adrian Marie described, Adrian Marie Brown describes as moving at the speed of trust, right? Um, and also just not getting caught up in the money, the building up of the organization and so on, and actually sticking to the values. We often talk about the social justice work as if it's out there, that we skip one part of it. What holds us together? What is it that our organization believes in? And how is that? How are those values? How do they look in practice? So a medical should ask itself, if our values are X, Y, Z, when we look at our partnerships with all of these other institutions, all of these other movements, are they a reflection of the values? Because very often for most institutions, for most organizations, and even in movements, we take values and put them up a wall. They're very nice to have things, but we never actually do the hard work, the unsexy work of putting them into practice, of operationalizing them. If Amanda's values are X, Y, Z, I as a leader within the organization have to interrogate how I speak to people in our community and beyond, is it a reflection of those values, you know? And that's that's crucial. So I do think that's an essential part of this work. Thank you very much. I could continue on that. That's a very interesting topic. But I want to ask uh, Yule, what is the situation? Are there more questions? Uh, what is the situation with regard to Professor Tsongola? Maybe you can update us a bit. Mm, okay, I hope you can uh, hear me. Yes, okay, perfect. Um, okay, um, Professor Nwangola unluckily doesn't respond anymore uh, to our email questions, so um, I don't know. The chat right now um, has run out of questions. I have one question, or at least one left. May I ask you, Kuketso? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> yeah, okay, thanks. Because actually I was glad that um, you hadn't mentioned the this annoying COVID topic until, well, until now. But um, you were talking about redistribution and um, I'm in 
COVID-19 and the redistribution of vaccines, for, for instance, uh, is a huge topic. So mm -hmm. what would be your proposal for organizing for a more just redistribution and or distribution? Um, yep, and um, knowing that you're also a digital activist, founder of Amantla Mobi, um, I wonder how or what possibilities um, you noticed or if there are any um, for a different modes of organizations, maybe also across continents, because now we are forced to you know, to knock out space and to, to be in a more digital form of space. Does that open any possibilities for other forms of connections and social movements, maybe? Cyber activism. <laughs> so I do think that um, I'm very wary of exceptionalizing technology today, right? Every generation has always had its own technological shifts that allowed it to connect to a much more bigger range of people. So I think about in South Africa, when printing technology became available, right? And suddenly you could have anti-apartheid publications such as the Labour Bulletin and so on be made possible. Instead of going door to door to tell people about what was going on, you could print posters, you know? And when we think about social networks, throughout history as technology has always evolved, we've always had social networks. So I think about the fax machine, right? If I had a fax machine and you had a fax machine and our friend had a fax machine, we could communicate with each other, fax each other. And that was its own social network, you know? So I'm very wary of thinking and speaking of technology as, as, as an exceptional thing in this day and age. But one cannot ignore that throughout history, just like we see today, every generation's own technological advancement meant it reached far more people. You know, the scale just completely, completely changed. And the scale today cannot be compared to anything of the past, right? It has enabled some of the most powerful organizing where people connected across, um, you know, continents, across, yeah, different spaces within their own localities, but it has also enabled new forms of surveillance, among other things. But the truth is that when I think about technology, I recognize that, and I think it is critical that we think of it this way, technology is not going away. As I've said, it has continuously evolved throughout history. We cannot afford to leave it in the hands of those whose only desire is to use technology to exploit people deepen inequalities and, you know, deepen like surveillance capitalism that we see all around us, we have an obligation that this technology exists. How do we creatively harness it to build the world which we want, right? How do we accept that it is one of many tools in our cupboards, you know, for lack of a better word, that we can use to advance the world, that, the world that we want to live in, you know? There is a danger when we leave it only to those who are going to do harmful things with it. So that is definitely the challenge I always pose when it comes to this issue of technology. What are you thinking? What are you doing, you know? How are you engaging with the technological space to disrupt um, these powers that just want to reinforce their own supremacy in so many ways. Um, the other question, I... Mm, <laughs> I got into the technology thing. Um, I completely forgot what was the first question. I mean, uh, I think you already answered them both. Um, ah, no, the COVID, the uh, redistribution of, of vaccines, of access to health. Um, yeah, talking about redistribution. But I really loved the part of, of you going into detail in uh, facts as social networks. That was really mind-blowing. Thanks. 
No problem. So I think COVID-19, um, we've always known that we live in a time of rising inequality and all of these things. But in some, in so many ways, COVID-19 has, has entrenched those inequalities so deeply and in some ways set us so far back that nobody can say they don't know. You know, even people who would ordinarily say, oh, I don't know that people are suffering. You can't, you can't. It's all around us. It's even in our homes, right? You think about what the school closures, for example, meant for women, right? Who are often the primary caregivers in South Africa, at least, who are often the primary caregivers of children, even when they are partnered, even when they have partners, women remain. And so the implications of that and the, job loss and all of the, you know, like the paid work was lost. Um, we saw women lost a lot of paid work, but the unpaid labor continued to grow, right? Which was a reinforcing of an already existing inequality. And so for me, there's just like, in a way, nobody can say they don't know. But on the other hand, you know, COVID-19 has been also revealing in many other ways. A pandemic does not bring to its knee, does not just come in and cause devastation, you know? What allows it to cause devastation is years of unequal healthcare access, is years of patent laws that have not ensured that everybody can access medication. It is years of neglect of state infrastructure. Therefore, there are people who do not have water. And even when we talk about the possibilities, right, given that people connect digitally, we must not forget that there is a significant number of people who still do not have access to the internet, right? Um, a significant number of people who still do not have access to certain devices that can connect. There's a reason why as a Mandela.mobi, I mean, one of the key things that we use is we are text-based, right? And what's, we use a lot of mobile technology in recognition that there's a significant part of South Africans who just cannot access internet. And even when they have web-enabled phones, um, because of the cost, the high cost of data, right? cannot access it. So there's all of these things that become very laid bare. Suddenly, in a time of COVID, right, um, going to the shop, I remember in South Africa, the police were harassing, particularly in poor, low-income areas, um, people who were going to the shop, which was allowed, right? But on the other hand, for somebody who has access, you could sit in your home, not go anywhere, and order just from your phone, you know? You could download these apps, you can order out. You had so much comfort. And the ability to have that comfort, again, re reinforces the fact that nobody can say they don't know what is going on. I have two children. Now, one of the things that happened with my kids was, so my household, we all have kind of um, respiratory issues. And over and above that, my grandmother is now living with us. But basically, our entire household is very vulnerable to COVID-19 complications. Suddenly, I am faced with a choice when the schools reopened. Do I send my children back to school? But knowing that our house has all of these complications, um, I didn't. I chose not to. But again, my kids go to a school that was exceptionally supportive, right? I could go fetch their assessments and whatnot. Even when deciding which piece of technology they would use, they took a stance that they were not going to do anything internet-based because they would leave too many of their children behind, right? But it's this is a minority, you know, this is not all schools are like that. And so you are also faced with this decision. Um, I mean, we talk all the time, but it was also just like, how do I teach my kids in this moment that just because they go to this particular school doesn't mean they can just retreat from the world as if nothing is going on, right? Live in comfort as if, you know, other kids have, you know, the same kind of life, you know? So in a way, COVID-19 really brought it to your face, the doorsteps, the decisions one had to make on a day-to-day -day basis, right? One of the things that informed like our decision is that where we live, which is Johannesburg, the public health service. So I'm like a public health healthcare person. Both my kids are born there. Most of my major surgeries done there. 
But on the other hand, because it is such poor service, the fact that we don't have access to any other place also means that it was even a bigger decision to decide that, okay, safety for us is going to require all of these things, you know? So, yeah, I do think that is the one thing. What's been very fascinating for me is I've seen people, unlikely suspects, you know, starting to call for things like a basic income grant, not just in South Africa, across the world, you know? Institutions that one would have never thought would actually even say the words basic income grant are now talking about them, you know? It feels like there are possibilities that become open up. But on the other hand, we should not wait for tragedy and devastation for these possibilities to be possible, right? We can do them before there is a pandemic so that the pandemic does not have such a devastating impact. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That was very powerful. And I think we could go on forever. There's a lot of questions and issues we would really like to share with you. Um, but um, I think um, we don't want to um, take too much of your energy and inputs now. And Yule, uh, uh, you have another uh, so Sorry for popping question. up again. Yeah. <laughs> um, so just giving the, the nearest background information because Boniface recently wrote that um, Professor Ngula is trying once again. And there's also um, a new question in the chat popping up. So I don't know, um, Koketsu, whether you feel comfortable still in continuing in, in answering our questions over and over. Um, no problem. Yeah? yeah. <laughs> Thank, Thank you very you. much. So we just... Um, uh, yeah, to transport a question that says, do you think that through higher visibility of Africans or black people in public, pop culture and social media, the Western world and especially younger people will become more interested, open-minded to African history? Um, I thought, uh, or will it help to make progress and advance in historical injustice, or will it rather reinforce racist prejudices and bigotry? Um, I think okay. you commented or already a bit on that, but maybe you can dive in further. Thank you. So I think the thing to bear in mind is that um, technology is not neutral, right? Um, technology can be used to reinforce existing power structures. And that's because technology does not just create itself. We can talk about the racist AIs, the coding bases, the people between them. We can even talk about content moderation, right? How white supremacists on a lot of social media networks are less likely to have um, their comments removed than you as a black person who's pushing back against racism, right? Um, there's all of those things, the content moderation, how those structures are owned, and also the fact that they, they are built to make money, right? They are designed by a capitalist colonial um, world, right? And that's why they function in the ways that they do. And thinking about it, we've seen amazing pushback, however. So I remember some exciting things that I have seen. And actually, you know, if... Um, people dug deeper, we would be in worse trouble if it wasn't for the work of certain people, right? So I remember at the beginning when the whole, when these bots were happening in the US, right? That were trying, that were pretending to be black and fueling all of this misinformation around activists and so on. It was black women who started noting that these white supremacist bots and actors are all involved. And then they started, when somebody was pretending to be black, they had a hashtag called you slip is showing so they could identify and actually had people paid attention to them then, the so-called alternate right wouldn't have risen in the ways that it did, right? We see people also taking on um, big, it, it's had such a massive impact in our political culture. I think about in Kenya, right? Um, Always, which is a pad brand that is run by, if I remember correctly, Unilever, was giving bad quality pads, you know. And women in Kenya went online 
and took it up as a massive challenge. Why is this quality of pads bad? So we are seeing, you know, the ways in which people, a reconfiguration of politics, you know. Um, I highly recommend Nanjala Nyabola's book. For some reason, I forgot the title, but she's based in Kenya. She's got two books. The one about digital democracies, um, Nanjala Nyabola, and which really looks at the ways in which in Kenya, you know, the effects of social media in Kenya and Kenyan politics as well. Yeah, in South Africa, I mean, we have seen whether it is people um, getting people who are known rapists, deplatforming known rapists and sexual abusers, right? We've seen people organize in quite different ways. Right now, during the Nigerian protests around INSARS, had it not been for videos and social media, we know that the government would never have admitted what happened during that massacre, right? People would not have been able to document it. Therefore, we would have had to wait for official word around it, right? So it has played such an important role. In Ethiopia, what's going on right now, and even in one of the most longest standing places of conflict, we know what is going on in Cameroon and the Anglophone conflict and the shutdown of the internet there. But still, people have found a way to organize and connect using these digital technologies. So yes, I do think that unless we are very deliberate about breaking down the structures that inform how these companies are run and built, unless we are very deliberate about creatively harnessing this technology, we are in trouble because all it will do is reinforce all of and re-entrench all of the existing power dynamics that we see everywhere. And we have to be completely deliberate about it. We cannot shy away from it as if it's something that is not tied to our day-to-day -day existence, right? As if it is not something that is tied to our material needs, you know, such as water, right? Because under COVID, we saw it became, access became such a core material need. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. I think I know already I want to have another uh, discussion round conference about the digital, the, the, the power of digital technology and com campaigning against it, what you said, and we will invite you again. I think that is a real, real important topic to understand and understand what you said, that the whole, the whole um, pitfalls, but also the opportunities and how, how to use it and how to understand. Koketsu, thank you so much. I think um, we want to slowly come to an end. It seems as if it, there's such unfortunate technology is not uh, on our side with regard to our second speaker, Professor Tsongola. I think he cannot connect. I don't know what the reason is, a technical problem. He was on in his waiting room and then got uh, the, the uh, line got collapsed again. So I think we want to maybe have another meeting with him at another stage. So we don't wait until for him now. I don't think that is uh, possible. Um, I, I, yeah, as I said, and we still need to continue talking around that uh, the whole digital power and how to use it. I would really love to do something that at, at another stage. But so thank you so much for for all your inspirational talk and your uh, your conversation. I think uh, it, it, a lot of things are still in my mind. And before we, we close, I want to ask if um, our colleague Boniface still wants to say something uh, to to round up this um, session. Uh, and then he can hand it back to me and I will thank to all the other background people helping us. Okay, thank you very much for uh, giving me the, the opportunity at least to, to say something again today. Um, I, I have been listening to, to the, the session with great attention and uh, I want to say for my part, already thank you very much Koketsu for everything you have said today. 
uh, you have remembered me of uh, people like uh, Steve Biko or Franz Fanon who thought about the dangers of uh, internal, internalizing the oppression uh, Biko was saying, uh, speaking about the this being the, the the most dangerous arm in the hands of uh, of the oppressor, the status of the mind of the oppressed people, um, and uh, I think it's a, a very powerful message because uh, when uh, you have uh, this kind of uh, status of the mind. Uh, you don't need white supremacists to emerge in a parent because other will do their job. And it's exactly the, the situation we are facing on the continent today. And thank you for remem remembering us um, uh, about that. But also about the necessity to build new alliances and coalitions in order to, uh, to overcome uh, this uh, status of our fur. And uh, speaking about this topic today is from us also as um, yes, as coalition running this conference, rethinking Africa an opportunity uh, to, uh, to to pay our respect to one of the the, the sons of the, the continent, uh, Jory Rawlings who left us uh, some weeks ago, former president of Ghana. I'm not mentioning him because he was a, presi a president, uh, but because uh, like his friend Thomas Sankara, he really understood the necessity to think and to rethink uh, Africa and to build the, the, the base for an autonomous continent. He has left us and we have the, the task to continue uh, what he, he has started uh, and what also many other daughters and sons of the, the continent uh, have started. We started this series this year with political uh, aspect of uh, independence. Um, we had Professor Lumumba as uh, uh, our guest. Uh, in the second uh, conference, we discussed the economy with Dr. Nongo Sila from Senegal. Uh, we have discussed uh, the necessity of decolonizing the mind today with you, Koketso. And we wanted to take it as also uh, a step to reflect on uh, what uh, Professor Njongolo uh, reflects on uh, the necessity for Africa to reclaim a second independence. Um, he hasn't been able to join us, although he has been trying since uh, 4, 4 .30. Uh, I think we'll find an opportunity to 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 to, to bring it to bring him into into picture. Maybe not uh, uh, through that way, but uh, live in uh, in Frankfurt or. So, Frankfurt or somewhere else in, in Germany, um, it, also, it will be maybe also the case with some of the, uh, the good people like Oketso and some others we have had this year. And th I think for people in Germany, it will be important to, to have them and discuss uh, with them uh, in live meetings so that uh, we can re uh, connect also, reflect on a very, uh, important uh, project we can uh, generate out of the of the conference it's what i wanted to to say at the end of this very very important uh, conference thank you for uh, giving me the floor and uh, i will hand it uh, back over to Ushe. thanks thank you boniface thank you very much um I think that was important. I'm sorry that you couldn't really be the facilitator today, and I hope you recover quickly and we can have another meeting where we all are strong and fit again. Um, before I close, I want to also thank two people in the background. The one is Jule, who was uh, um, 
you know, looking at the chat question, and the other one is Katie, who is doing the technical support from the back. I know this is always a big schlep work. They have to start earlier and finish later. Thank you very much. Without them, we couldn't have this, uh, um, this meeting. And finally, Koketsu, is there, if there's anything you want to say in the end, I'll give you the floor. Otherwise, I'll, yeah, if you want to say goodbye or something, you're welcome. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to everybody who joined in. And yeah, I found myself quite stimulated as well by the comments and the questions that came through. So absolutely grateful. Thank you. Okay. Thank you also to the listeners and to the, the questions. And I hope to see you uh, or hear you or connect you again in one of our next meetings. Okay. Wish you a good evening and bye-bye.